in a world where a lot of us have a scarce mindset and we're trying to make money, we're trying to make sure that anybody we help, we get paid for, we get high paying client. That seems to be the mantra that most people are advocating out there. But it seems to me like you came out with like open heart, share as much as possible, and you found success in the process. What the hell's going on here? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it wasn't something I, I, I didn't know that this was going to happen this way, right? It, I kind of fell into it. And I'm so grateful that I did because the way I did allowed me to want to share it with others too, to open their eyes, to open your eyes and yours to this. And my story kind of goes back to 2008, the Great Recession. I was on my way to becoming an architect and I was I was well on my way to, to do that. Um, I took several tests. I was getting promoted and, and, and I had just gotten a raise and I had just gotten engaged and all these amazing things were happening in my life. And then the recession happened and I got the uh, sort of rug pulled out under me and I kind of lost everything. I lost my job. I got let go. And I remember that because like every second of that, I, I remember because it was so... It was like getting the wind knocked out of you. Uh, and, and it hurt a lot because I had dedicated my life to the world of architecture and doing everything I could. And even though I followed the path that I was told to be on, that my parents told me to be on, that schools told me to be on, et cetera, to live this successful, uh, stable life and have a stable career, I still got let go. And I was very upset as well. And I'm very grateful because it was around this time that podcasts were starting to become a thing. And I was very early on to listening to them because I had all this time. And I uh, stumbled across a podcast called Internet Business Mastery, and it was one particular episode. Sometimes that's all it takes. One story can change your life. And it was a story about a guy named Cornelius Fitchner who was helping people pass what was called the project management exam or the PM exam, a very technical exam for project managers. And I didn't know anything about it, but he was telling the story about how he created um, a resource online, a website to help people find the information that they needed to study to download some other additional resources and eventually pay for products that he was selling like study guides and they were all digital. So it was all kind of automatically working for him. And it was also around this time that Tim Ferriss wrote the book Four Hour Work Week. So it was kind of like all these things combined that made me go, well, could I do that? And what have I got to lose? The barrier to entry to do something like this is very low and I had time. So what I did was I built a website called inthelead.com, L-E-E-D, which is a acronym for the exam that I was helping people pass. And very shortly, I started to notice that I was getting some traffic. And this traffic, traffic was coming from Google. It was coming from different forums where people were finding my information and then sharing it with other people because I was one of the only ones who was openly talking about how to study for and pass this exam. Everybody else was putting all this information inside study guides to pass, which were costing hundreds of dollars. And so it was kind of blowing people's minds that just by openly sharing my own experience passing this exam was helping people. And eventually people said, Pat, you need to put this stuff into like a resource or a guide. And so, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, but I wrote a Word document that was about 60 pages in length and I printed it as a PDF file and just sold it with a PayPal sort of button. And in that first month in October of 2008, I had generated from a $19.99 study guide, uh, $7,908.55. That's after like fees were taken by PayPal. And it, and it just blew me away. You know, and initially I was very excited about it, but then all these feelings started to come, come about like, well, this doesn't even feel real. This doesn't feel right. I didn't go to school for this. I went to school for that. And I thought that something was going to come crashing down. And I remember the next month, the income continued to grow because more people started to find the guide. And I started to realize that the more that I poured into serving this community of architects and designers, the more it would just continually come back my way. And this is where I first learned this principle of your earnings are a byproduct of how well you serve your audience. And it just continued to prove itself. Every time I poured more into this space, I kept getting more back. And it wasn't even, it, it never felt like selling to me because it was always coming back with thanks. And it was always with the understanding that it was either don't get my guide and struggle and waste money on this exam or pay a little bit to get access to this information or even get the free information and help your way through this material and save time, save money. And it got to a point, and I talk about this in my book, Superfans, that People who took the exam ended up sharing my website and getting and convincing their entire office to buy my study guide for me. So this one woman who I remember helping, her name was Jackie. She passed the exam. She was so thrilled about doing it. And without me even knowing, she shared the resource with all 25 of her other coworkers and convinced them to all buy the exam guide as well. She could have just shared it for free with them, but she wanted me to get something back in return for what I gave her. And eventually that one person I discovered turned into 25 sales. So if I could help just an individual, 
I can really help a lot more people on top of that because that sharing will naturally happen when you create something amazing. So at the end of 2008, more and more people started discovering that I was creating this resource and I was making two and a half, three times, four times, five times more money than I was making as an architect, um, which again, just was still trippy. I was still, in fact, the interesting thing, you'd mentioned the fear. I did not know how long this was gonna last. I didn't think it was real. So I was actually, despite making five times more than I was making as an architect, I was looking for more architecture jobs because I was just so, that was what I thought I was supposed to do. And the analogy I often use is, I was basically straddling two ladders. I had my corporate ladder that I was climbing and I kind of got thrown off a little bit, but I still had my foot on it. And then here, here was this new entrepreneurial ladder and the sky was the limit and I was climbing it, but I could only climb so much as my foot on the other ladder would let me go. And so eventually I had to make the choice to fully dedicate myself to that new ladder and fully let go of the other. And that only happened in May of 2009, in fact. Uh, so it took a while for me to understand that this might actually be a new path for me. I was still going in for interviews. Luckily, nobody was hiring me at the time. And I'm truly grateful about that because who, who knows? Again, I was just so conditioned to believe that this was who I was supposed to be. And it was so hard for me to believe that I could do this. But it was at the end of 2009 that I, or 2008 that I created smartpassiveincome.com to share with other people in the very same manner. Let me just share everything that I'm learning and, and everything that's working, the good, the bad, the ugly, what I wish I had done differently. And I think one thing that I decided to do very early on that a lot of people really loved was I was just sharing exactly how much money I was making and where it was coming from, these income reports. And nobody in the space was really doing that. But to me, it was just so obvious to do that. If I was gonna teach this stuff, and people were going to choose to spend time with me. I wasn't even selling anything uh, on the website, but I knew that people were taking time to read this. I treated it like how we invest our money in stocks and companies that we support, right? They share quarterly reports of how their business is doing, so I, as an investor with my money, can understand if it's worth continuing or not, and I can understand the health of the company. So I figured, well, I should do the same thing. I should give my audience an update on the health of me and my company and what's going on so that you can make an informed decision as to whether or not I fit your style and you believe what I'm saying and you wanna do something similar. Uh, and then really what put the cap on this, and I apologize, I had a little bit of coffee right before this to stay up later because I am in San Diego, California. But um, the biggest thing out of all this, both on the lead exam stuff and especially with Smart Passive Income is I started to get thank you notes from people. I started to get actual thank you notes, handwritten notes from people saying, Pat, you've changed my life. You've introduced me to this new thing that I didn't know existed. I didn't think I can do it until you led the way. And that really taught me about the human to human connection with all of this. Like that is such a key component. The empathy that you have for the people who you are serving is by far the most important thing because when you have that empathy and understanding of what they're going through and what they're thinking and, and what their struggles are and what their goals are, you can help come to them at their, at their level and help them along the way. And the analogy I like to use is I'm like, we're all going through this forest of entrepreneurship together. And because I have a little bit, a bit uh, of experience in it, I'm the guy at the front of the pack with the machete. And let me take the hits for you. Let me get through the thorns and the bushes. Let me see if there's any dangerous animals ahead. I'll carve a path for everybody else behind me. But I'm not like, I'm bringing everybody with me. I'm not at the top of a mountain shouting down. We're all, we're all in this together and we're figuring it out as a group. Fantastic. There's so much that was just shared in this clip. So uh, I want to unpack a few of the things that were mentioned that I thought were worth digging deeper into. So first off, I love this aspect that you had to kind of make a decision about jumping the ladder, you know, even doubting the results that you were, you were getting, seeing, oh my God, is this going to be consistent? Is this going to provide me the security? Because jumping in the field of entrepreneurship, you don't get the same kind of predictable, you know, contract, annual salary expectations that you would get with a career. You're seeing things that could be good in a month, but how long will it last? And that can cause mm -hmm. some anxiety. So the first thing I wanted to unpack with you, Pat, is was there a certain moment that you went, okay, it's worth letting go of the you know, I, I, what did I need to learn to be able to say, I can let go of the architecture and dump, jump into this full time? Because the opposite that I want to highlight is some people might let go of the other ladder, jump into entrepreneurship without any revenue, and then find themselves becoming needy or desperate, which can often make you make decisions that don't serve the client as best as possible. Right. In that latter case, it's often 
smart to have some sort of safety net or, or, or nest egg that you could pull from that you know that you can have some room to experiment and even if it were to fail, at least you gave it a chance and you'd still be okay, right? So I do think there's a lot of uh, validity to just not just taking the leap without taking a smart leap, right? But for me, it was a very specific moment because even though, you know, some people when they go through this transition from work to entrepreneurship, um, they have a specific dollar value in mind to get to before they feel comfortable making that jump. For me, I was way past that already, yet I was still doubting whether this was what I was supposed to do. But it was in May of 2009, the recession was, we were coming out of the recession and I had gotten a call from my boss, the same boss who had let me go. And I hadn't heard from him kind of since then. And so it was a really interesting conversation. He called and he sounded very, like he was just on, he, he just wanted to make sure I was okay. He's like, Pat, hey, uh, you know, how are you doing? I'm calling because I, I know it's been a, a, a rough year. And in my head, I was like, yeah, it was, but then I figured it out and I'm doing pretty well now. And he said, you know, Pat, I wanna, you know, you were one of the best that I worked with. I wanna hire you for, you know, I branched out. He, he started his own company. He brought a lot of his, my coworkers with him and some of the clients that we had. So it would have been a fresh start in a brand new office. He offered me a corner office with more pay than I did before. And he offered to help pay for me and my family to move there and pay for a year's rent for free. Like he was recruiting me. And I did not hesitate at all to say thanks, but no thanks. And when I hung up and I realized that I had just in a snap moment made that decision to let go of that ladder and move on to the next one. So that was a way for me to understand. And this is the exercise I often recommend for people who are thinking about entrepreneurship or who, who, who need to make a decision like this is to think about your, your life a year from now, right? Let's say you make de decision A. Let's get into the DeLorean, travel 88 miles per hour and go a year into the future. What, what is your life like? How is your day? What are, you, what are you doing? Are you fulfilled? Are there things that you wish you had that you didn't have? And then come back to today and take decision B and do the same exact thing and see and imagine what that, that life uh, might be like and what your day is like and what you're doing and what your wishes are and are you there? And then come back to today and go, how did each of those feel? Which one would you have preferred and what regrets might you have had? And to think about those things now in this thought experiment is so key because it allows you to almost predict what would happen if you succeed one way or another. And that's the thing. You, you actually go into that path of A or path of B as if it goes the way you imagine it and hope it would go. Because when you're there and you discover, wow, I'm actually not fulfilled or I would regret not giving this a shot then you can now know what decision to make today. So I love that DeLorean sort of sort of thought experiment. That combined with a very clear understanding, and I talk about this in my book, Will It Fly? You know, Will It Fly is about picking an idea and going with it, right? Validating a market idea and, and, and having it be proven to give you the best chance to work. But the first three chapters of the book aren't even about business ideas. They're about you and what makes you fulfilled. Imagining yourself in the future and what would make life awesome then? You make your decisions now to support your future self in that state. Not a, not a I wish, it's what you will be if everything goes the way you want it and you can make those correct decisions now using that as a filter. And that's the whole first part of the book is understanding what you're gonna say yes to and what you're gonna say no to, which is a whole nother topic for entrepreneurs. It's like, how do we, it, it can be very difficult to say no, even though you should sometimes, so God, anyway. I'm facing this <laughs> dilemma right now. I, like, oh, yeah. I, it's like, there's so much that is coming my way and I'm just like, Oh my God, I, I, there's a there's almost like a scarce mindset in myself that says, if I say no to something, am I saying no to the universe to not send me abundance? Right. But instead, what I hear you saying is that no, is that when you're in those situations, you get to pick more of the reality you want to see by imagining what happens when I say yes to this. Will yes. more of this come? Absolutely. And then you're more aligned. Is that how I understand it? That, that, that's exactly right. And also understanding what your values are and, and who, you know, like the more that you know about those kinds of things, the easier it is to say no. It becomes harder when there's especially a lot of dollars involved, but at the same time, just because you say no now, you might find a better opportunity comes around because you've made room for yourself and you have recommitted to the things that you've said yes to. That's the big thing. The truth is when you say yes to something new, you're also saying no to something old. And you gotta realize that there's not a million yeses that you can have without something breaking. And oftentimes that breaking is 
your your mental health, your physical health sometimes, or relationships, and we, and we don't want that to happen. So it's really important to understand what these filters are so that you can say yes and invite the things in your world that you know will support where you want to go. Mm. Yeah, I found myself having a lot of attachment to some of the things that brought me to where I am now. Uh, and for me, one of the things is I had a very long relationship working with Mind Valley. Like I've worked for them for nine years. I still am a host. Uh, sorry, I'm still an author on their platform, but I'm no longer hosting. I'm no longer working with them. And there's parts of me that would always find myself wanting to gravitate towards old relationships from there and, you know, contacts that I made from there. But I was actually saying no to what is the next things I could be working on, which is what I've started leaning more into. And then I started realizing, wow, like I'm making new connections. I'm, I'm finding myself with new work opportunities that had nothing to do with my past. And so this kind of ladder situation really hit me when you shared it earlier, because I'm feeling that and seeing what happens when I made the double hand jump on one ladder and say, yeah. let's start climbing. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably a conflict point for a lot of people that are stepping into something new. That's so true. And what got you here won't get you there is the phrase that I learned. And it's so true. Yeah. There's... Um, my God, there was so much more you had uh, said in your opening statement, we could say. Um, and, and I wanted to pick out another one, which is your level of transparency, which feels like it's one of your core values, like you opening your books, showing to everyone. And uh, I just wanted to understand how your approach feels so different than most I've seen out there, because I hear so much online, social media, it's so much loudness around people saying, I'm making you know six, seven figure income, and I can teach you how to do the same. But nobody really shows the source of their income. And I feel like there's a uh, there's almost like a educate to educate pyramid going on in the ecosystem right now, which is like, I can make six figure, seven figure by teaching other people how to make six figure, seven figure. And that's the only source that generates the six figure, seven figure. Now I feel like I'm saying it way too often, but in your case, you've always been transparent on your source and it was never just on a, you know, collecting or funneling money towards the top, which feels very MLM-y. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to get your glimpse for someone who's seen this space evolve for the last 15 years. What are the things that you like or not like about the current state of online marketing? Well, what I like is that that transparency is becoming more and more prevalent. I think people online are more um, open with how they feel when certain brands behave or act a certain way. And I, and I think that's important. There's a, there's more accountability for, for brands, I think now more than ever. And I'm, I'm glad to have led the charge there. I definitely was not the first one to share numbers. The other people have as well. And in fact, I, I, I need to give credit to uh, a personal finance blog in 2007 that I used to read. This was before I was let go. Um, I was really into personal finance and retirement account, you know, that kind of stuff. And it was a blog at mymoneyblog.com. And what I found fascinating about them was they were one of the only ones to, when they were talking about investing into the stock market and portfolios, to literally share which stocks and, port and, and portfolios they were, you know, investing into and what mutual funds, like the ticker, exactly. And that was like, I was just like, oh, thank you. Like, now I can make a decision if that ticker makes sense for me, but I now know that what you're saying is true because it can be tracked and I can see it. And that was so key for me and that helped me to trust them more. And this is why I started out with that. And again, just I want people to know what's going on so they can make the best and, and most informed decision. And then th thankfully, a lot of other entrepreneurs have done the same thing. But, you know, at the same time, I've also realized that I, being a part of this space, have a duty to, in fact, share that you don't have to just talk about making money online in order to make money online, which is why you often f see, especially in my podcast, I invite a lot of other success stories onto the show. Yes, we bring people like Gary Vaynerchuk and Tim Ferriss and all these big names on. But honestly, the more downloaded podcast episodes are from people like Shane and Jocelyn Sams, episode 121. These are two teachers from Kentucky who heard my podcast one day, literally mid mowing their lawn, stopped because they heard a podcast and decided right then that they were gonna start an online business to help teachers and help football coaches, which is what they knew. And their lives changed forever. They're now millionaires as a result of going down that path. And so when I can enable the listeners to see there are people just like them succeeding who have taken that first step, who have gone through a lot of the obstacles, the same obstacles that people are, are, are who are listeners are going through too, they have more of a belief that they can do it too because somebody else has already done it before them and has paved the way and has proved that the things that I'm talking about are in fact real. And then bringing new niches into the space. Maria, one of our SPI Pro uh, sort of members, she uh, has a, a podcast called Bloom and Grow Radio. She helps people choose the right houseplants 
to have a better mindset in their workspace. It's such like an intriguing niche and she's got hundreds of thousands of downloads now that she started her podcast thanks to our work and she now has a traditional book deal that just got into place because of her work. And it's when I share stories like that that people go, yeah, the truth is these stories exist probably more than the money to money, make money online stuff. They just, there's no reason for people to share like the money to money people because, you know, they're doing their work. And I'm just grateful that I have a platform to be able to, you know, share these stories in a community where these people exist who, who have taken our work and, and have actually implemented it, um, w which is fantastic. So the hard thing is there's always going to be the, those kinds of people out there who do, you know, sit in their garages and talk about their Ferraris and Lamborghinis and, and whatever. But, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's great that people are now more openly sharing that those things are not necessarily real. And and I think it's important for any creator to realize that as well, that when you pretend to be somebody you're not or you rent certain things to look flashy on video, for example, sure, you might attract a large crowd, large crowd, but is that is that the right crowd for you? Are you happy attracting people based on a lie or something that's fake? Or might you instead realize that your vibe attracts your tribe? When you are yourself out there, you are immediately standing out from the crowd because you're you and nobody's like you. And that took me a while to understand as well. It took me a couple of years to realize that, you know, because I was I was always, I always had this imposter syndrome, like, wow, there's all these other marketers that are much better. They're making a lot more money than me and their income reports are much bigger. But the truth is, I realize that people gravitate toward me because I am me and I have a certain way to go about things. I'm not about the mansions and Lamborghinis. I'm about the, you know, the minivan and bringing the kids to school every day. And that's what makes this life rich is I get to spend more time with my kids. And I think that's what people gravitate toward with me as, as well as just the transparent nature of, of what I do. So um, you got to be careful out there. But this is why communicating and talking with other people is great because you can share ideas and, and kind of weed through the uh, and filter through the the nasty out there to find the good ones. Brilliant. Well, um, for someone who's been close in the space of online marketing for, like I said, last 10 to 15 years and always seen you as one of these beacon of shining light, embodying a lot of the things that I speak about in selling with love as well. Uh, I'm just so honored that you were able to be this beacon of light to show others a way that can be done that comes with integrity, that makes an impact, uh, has empathy for who you serve. So I just want to tip my hat to you. Um, but Thank I also you. want to ask a question. This one will come from a more selfish perspective, but I felt like this would be a powerful question to ask you. Probably going to come from a left field, but play with me on this. Um, oh, yeah. I think you're, you, you've recently become a father or you've had your child, you know, growing up with you. And I'd be curious to know how different were you operating your business now that you've become a father, as opposed to how before you were a father, because you know, some people might actually resist wanting to start families because they want to be on hustle mode. And I'd just be right. curious to know what was your experience and transition in the process? So definitely before having a child, and you know, I'm, I'm relatively not a new father, um, but there are new challenges coming every day. I mean, my son's going to be 13 this year, and that's a, the whole new world, uh, uh, and my daughter's 10. But I, I have vivid memories of before having a child of being very much, I got to hustle. I'm going to, I'm going to overwork. And this was, this was like prime Gary V time, right? Where it was all about like, you know, you, you're proud of the fact that you only slept four hours so you can get more work done. That's just such a now looking back silly and also very unhealthy way to, to live a life. But I get it, right? You, it, this is the prime time you could take more risks because you don't have a family yet. Sure, you, you get up and you hustle and you, you go, go, go. But I also remember a lot of problems with that. Even after I got married before we had kids, April and I would have conversations and I was like tuning out what she was saying sometimes because I was so focused on that next email I had to write or sales coming in and all that kind of stuff. And there was one time she actually caught me. She called me out because she she knew I wasn't all there. I was having a conversation with her and her mouth was moving, but I was thinking about something else. And she called me out on it. She said, you're thinking about your business now, aren't you? And unfortunately, me being who I was and, and you know, kind of prideful, I was like, no, no, I was listening. Like, I, I knew what you were talking about. And she said, okay, well, what, what was I just saying? And of course she caught me, but I, I, uh, said, um, well, you said you're thinking about your business, aren't you? Uh, and it didn't go very well from there. So I slept on the couch that night, but it was a very important conversation to be had because she helped me realize that I was way out of control with where my personal life and where my business entrepreneurial life existed. They were all one in the same and that wasn't fair to her. And it definitely would not be fair to my kids, uh, when we would have kids. 
which we were planning to do. Now, when Kaoni was born, my son, I remember very quickly, first of all, a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, and a lot of, oh my gosh, I need to you know be the best father I can be. I need to make the business work. And I was still in sort of startup mode at that time. But I also remember minutes mattered more than ever. If I caught myself down a Facebook rabbit hole, 30 minutes just looking at cat videos, for example, I would have such guilt because those were 30 minutes that were not used for work and 30 minutes that were taken away from my son. What a waste. So I became a productive machine when my baby was born. In fact, this is a very common effect. When you have a kid, you get into, holy crap, every decision I make matters now. I better be working on the things that actually pull the lever. And there's a lot more at stake here. Therefore, you oftentimes will go bigger um, because of that. And, and that's what I did. But I removed a lot of the extras in my life so I could focus on things that I knew were working and just needed me and my time. Um, I'm not saying if you want to be a productive machine, like just go have babies. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but something did happen mentally when Kaoni was born and I saw him in my hands and then I would catch myself wasting time and and and, and losing attention here and there. So uh, it, it really changed me and helped me really become optimized in the work that I do, not just in my work, but also in my personal life. And so I, I now have two things that work in my favor to help me become a better entrepreneur and a better father and husband. Number one, I have a time boundary. So yes, I escaped the nine to five, if you, if you say it, or essentially I got kicked out of the nine to five. And it's like, yay, freedom, I can work whenever. No, if you, if you say that, you will work all the time because your work as an entrepreneur never ends. So you have to end it yourself at whatever time that you set for yourself and, and you have to honor that. But just the time alone wasn't enough for me because I wasn't disciplined enough. So I needed a physical space to remove myself from to mentally clock out, essentially. When I worked nine to five, I drove home and I wasn't in front of my work computer and I, I didn't have my architectural desk. So there was no work to be done. But at home, and especially now with phones, it's so easy to just like do things. So I had to put these things into place, a time boundary and a physical boundary between my work and my personal life to, to make it work. Well, Pat, thank you for entertaining that question. And uh, when it comes to these boundaries around time and space, it's something I've been facing right now. And that's why you're actually the last podcast that's going to be happening in this studio space, which is in my home, as I rented out an office space so I can make sure there oh. is that physical separation so I can have Congrats, disconnected man. time on time and make that maximization that when you're in the office, things need to get done. But also this was the assumption that I feel I've seen with uh, so many uh, people that, you know, they get a child and they seem to even turn up their productivity uh, and even set even more powerful boundaries, realizing that there's something at home uh, that you want to be taking care of, having time for, and uh, really great perspective to give there. So thank you so much for that. One of the last things I wanted to ask you, because I feel like most people who might be coming to you are like, what is the one thing I should do? Uh, what is the channel I should go for. I don't want to sure. answer any or ask any question like that because what I want to encourage everybody to do is go to the Smart Passive Income website of Pat Flynn. All the resources are there. Subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the blog, go buy a copy of the books. Will It Fly? Super fans are probably the places you're going to want to start in your journey of learning with Pat from things that we've covered on today as well. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, Pat, instead is for anybody who's about to make picks on which channel they want to go through, how to get started and getting attention, earning trust, is what is a step that you would tell them to do before even considering going on this journey, which feels like it's more of an internal process that needs to happen? I have the answer for you. And this will help you determine what niche to get in. This will help you determine where the energy is going to be and, and how to, to love it on an audience and, and, and get something back in return. And this is what I've been teaching my audience because starting a business and becoming an entrepreneur can be overwhelming. There, there, There's a million different pathways you can take. And if we see all those choices and we uh, worry about which one is the right one for me, we often go nowhere and waste time um, and then feel bad about ourselves. And we kind of like continue to down spiral from there. So I have the answer. Find one person in a particular niche, whatever niche you might have interest in, it could be something that you are passionate about. It could be something that you are, are already involved in. It could be something that people ask you a lot about. Whatever it is, find one single person and help them get one single result based on a problem or a struggle that they have or a challenge. You don't need a website to do that. You don't need nothing. You just need 
the care to help somebody achieve something or unlock uh, something that had once been inconvenient or whatever it might be. One person, one result. The reason this is key is because number one, one person, that's doable. It's not 10, 100, 1,000 like we often make it. You don't have to create the next Uber or eBay or whatever in order to succeed. Start with one, let's make it simple. Finding that person is gonna be an exercise, but now once you find one, you'll know there's gonna be more there later. But then helping this one person, convincing them that you have something that you can offer them and working with them, and that's gonna help you discover what that's actually like. What are the challenges that they're going through? What are the challenges that you go through as you try to help and serve this audience? You're gonna understand what questions they're asking. You're gonna understand what obstacles they're gonna go through, obstacles that you thought you knew or maybe aren't there and ones that you didn't know about come about. And most importantly, when you get them that result, not only will you, that feel amazing, not only will you now have like a testimonial to help you on your way to build something, you will now have the confidence that what you are doing matters because that is the, one of the most important things. And if you're selling an online course or, or maybe you're just even getting started with consulting or coaching or singing lessons, whatever it might be, find one person to help and I promise you it unlocks all the rest because that's the biggest thing I see a lot of people struggling with when, when starting is they just don't know that they can be helpful. So it's hard to charge for something when you aren't sure that you can help people. It's hard to step forward and command a, a, a piece of content when you haven't really actually helped anybody yet. So go through that experience. You're going to learn so much, not just about the people that you're serving. And first, also, you might realize that you actually didn't enjoy serving that audience, which is okay. It's so good to know that now versus later, after you've dedicated time and effort and money into building a website and an entire agency around this or whatever it might be. Discover that now. But the, the truth is when you get that energy up front and you understand it, you're you're gonna have the confidence to move forward and know that what it is that you're creating, know what, that what it is that you're selling is of service to you because you can no longer doubt yourself that this isn't helpful. You have proven it to yourself. You have one person under your belt and where there is one, there's likely more. Pat? What a legendary conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Had a ton of fun, learned a ton for myself, a lot of reflection that I was able to do on a lot of the things you've shared. So I want to thank you personally for that. And on behalf of everybody else listening to the Selling With Love podcast, big thank you for coming on the show and sharing. I do like to ask one question before sending people off, which is being on a Selling With Love podcast, I would love to ask from your perspective, what does Selling With Love mean to you? It means having empathy for those who you are serving and serve first and the world will pay you back one way or another, whether it's through payment from serving that person or perhaps through sharing uh, to another person uh, or perhaps even by feedback, which is just as valuable, if not often more valuable than getting a payment for something. So have empathy for who it is that you're serving. Learn the language that they use to describe their problems so that you can reflect it back to people like them and just keep going. I mean, it's gonna be tough but you keep going because you love them, right? Pat, legendary. Honestly, I, th I know a lot more about you than you know about me, but I'm telling you, we're cut from the same cloth. I'm so happy about everything you shared because it's so aligned to everything we talk about here. And mm. uh, you are definitely an honorary guest on the show. Thank you so much for coming. And for everybody else tuning in, make sure you have a look into the show notes. We'll have a ton of links for some of the resources from Pat. You will go down a rabbit hole that are not cat videos. These are gonna be productive, helpful, and might get you unstuck at any point in your entrepreneurial journey. Have a look at his courses. Everything he produces is high quality. And grab a copy of his books if you want to have the best reading material by your bedside. Once again, thank you all for tuning in and keep selling with love.